so um, uh, a quick introduction from me. Hopefully our, our regulars uh, know me, although you may not recognise me with the uh, Christmas jumper and the stupid Christmas hat. This, this is a result of a, of a bet. Um, and um, But it's Christmas, so I'm trying to enter into the spirit of it and bring a bit of Christmas joy. Um, hopefully it won't detract from a, uh, a, an engaging uh, session with everyone. Um, so for the regular audience, you'll know that the format is, is that I, I, uh, I'm going to go around and ask our panellists to just give a, a 30 second, one minute introduction um, to uh, uh, themselves. And then I've got some uh, some questions which, uh, which we're going to dive into and um, see if we can get some stimulating conversation. Um, as um, as uh, Chris said, you know, really be good to get uh, audience participation. So drop your questions in. Anything that any of the panelists say that just stimulates a thought in your mind, get it in there. We'll see it pop up, and I'll and I'll try and uh, I'll try and throw it up and see see what they think of it. Okay, great. So uh, let's kick off. Um, uh, uh, we've got Lord Ed Vasey. Ed, are you there? Oh. I'm here. There he is. Hi, Ed. Good evening. Do you want to just do a quick introduction of yourself? Yes, I'm Ed Vasey. I was an MP for 15 years. Uh, for six of those years, I was David Cameron's technology minister, uh, longest serving in that role. And I left uh, the House of Commons in the 2019 election and I got appointed to the House of Lords in 2020. Excellent. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate that. Anna, do you want to give us an intro? Absolutely. So um, I'm currently a chief product officer of a, a consumer fintech platform called Totally Money. We provide credit reports and um, match people to financial products based on their profile. Um, my background is, as, as uh, it was mentioned earlier, I, I do tend to work with a couple of different businesses uh, as an advisor. I also have very few small uh, seed investments in a couple of businesses. I sit on the board of a venture capital trust where I work with some businesses as well. Obviously, technology and building technology products remain the, the main passion of my career. So uh, great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Tucci? Yes, of course. Um, this is Tucci. I'm the founder and CEO of Streetpeace. Streetpeace started about six years ago. It's a um, consumer intelligence platform. We basically capture real life behavior as and when it happens in an unstructured form as images, open text or videos. We capture millions of moments like that, like ordering food from Deliveroo, for example, tonight. And then we turn all of that unstructured data into business intelligence so that the large scale consumer companies can understand where the needs are and serve the market needs better. It basically replaces traditional market research. Um, as you mentioned, David, earlier, we raised about $75 million to date. We just closed our Series B a couple of months ago, and we will continue with building our deep technology to be able to make sense of that unstructured data and real life moments. Excellent. Thank you, Tucci, and welcome. Uh, will. Hi, everyone. Good to meet everyone. Uh, my name is Will. I'm the CIO at uh, Deliveroo, uh, but a data scientist slash numbers guy by trade just in general. Uh, Deliveroo, hopefully everyone has heard of and hopefully even more, well, sorry, I hope even more that you've had a chance to order from us. Uh, we founded back in 2013 uh, and have had a, a really fantastic growth story since then now, delivering uh, uh, you know, millions and millions of meals uh, uh, every single week um, across you know, more than 13 countries and more than 200 cities. Uh, yeah, the, the pandemic's been an especially interesting time for us, as I'm sure you can imagine. And so looking forward to, to, uh, to sharing some insights about uh, that this evening. That's great. Thank you very much, Will. And then Ben, last but not least. Hi, folks. I'm uh, Ben Chisel. So I'm VP of product at Oak North. So those of you who don't know Oak North, we're a kind of like we've got two companies, really. We're a UK bank uh, and we have a credit intelligence platform that we uh, sell to banks around the world to help them make better decisions about who to lend to. So that's a, you know, a credit version of what uh, Tucci had mentioned, um, really about helping uh, institutions take all of this unstructured data about businesses and use it as the you know, way to improve the intelligence in their, their business. So um, I've been a career product guy mostly, almost 15 years doing product management for various companies from pre-product through to, to Amazon, uh, mostly on the kind of uh, you know, deep data side of things, um, but, you know, quite a lot of breadth of experience as well across a few different areas. Let's get into our questions if we can. 
so the first one is many directors are feeling outmatched by the ferocity of changing technology, emerging risks, new competitors, etc. So what are the advantages of having a, an IT, a tech person actually on your board, you know, holding a board seat? I know this is happening a lot, but but, you know, there are still some boards who are a little old fashioned and the IT guy or girl doesn't quite make it onto the onto the board. Um, Ed, what what are your feelings uh, uh, about this? What you know? What, uh, it, it, do you think the government is keen to see this kind of representation at a board level? Do you know that some uh, IT people suffer from some social uh, disadvantages? So they wear funny Christmas jumpers and funny Christmas hats at uh, you know serious top level discussions. But I do agree with you that uh, absolutely they should have uh, board should have tech people. Uh, on the board. I think the fundamental point here is that too many people think that uh, they have a company and digital is an add-on and they don't actually think we're running a digital company. We may have bricks and mortar buildings, we may be selling bricks and mortar products, but even you know the local supermarket that you pop down to to get your pint of milk, all of that distribution and so on is functioning on digital. And at the very least, there should be someone on the board who understands something about cybersecurity because that little supermarket, uh, to kind of um, echo what Tuge was saying about uh, street bees, you know, is hoovering up uh, data, very sensitive data that could uh, uh, needs to be, um, you know, kept safe. Uh, but also it's constantly looking at uh, new technology innovations uh, the trucks taking the stuff to the supermarket and depending on technology. So someone on your board who understands what is going on in technology is, in my view, absolutely essential. Thank you, Ed. Um, I think that, uh, you know, you talk about cybersecurity. Re recently, I took my cybersecurity, head of cybersecurity, along to my board at Naked Wines to kind of give them the run through of the current risks we were monitoring. And at the end of it, our last recommendation to the board was, actually, we'd like to take you through a cybersecurity training course because you guys can't ask us these questions and not know what the answers mean. And they were all really up for it. So that's really good. A Anna, what, what about you? You sit on some boards, you know, you've been, you've been there. Are you finding, you know, you're a good representation? Are there lots of people on these boards with, who are tech savvy? I, I completely agree that we do need people with uh, technology skills on the board. And... Uh, you know, most businesses are technology businesses, they just don't know it yet, right? So I think that's the, the, the main issue. Some interesting uh, data, which in you know, one of the data points that came out in 2016 when Accenture did a, a, a survey was that only 6% of big bank directors had anything to do with technology, for instance. And that is in 2016, when the entire banking sector was well on to, the, to being disrupted by you know, technology-based challenges, right? So that's sort of the problem. And I, I agree with you that, uh, yes, it, there need to be, needs to be more technology representation, but there is also a, another side to the coin, which is just like the boards need to listen to technology a lot more and they need, it needs to be more of a, an ear for technology from the board side. I think there is something that the technology leaders need to do to become uh, fit, more fit or suitable to the board environment because working at the board level requires slightly different skill sets. It requires being able to go outward and sort of turn into a bit of a, a bit more about technology in the context of the business rather than, you know, more focused on technology. So I think there is a, I've seen that there are some boards who have actually gone out of their way to try and bring in digital nets, technology nets, whatever they call it. Then, but then they struggle to take full advantage of that, their skill sets because there is that little gap still remaining. So I think boards need to, to actively seek and develop technology skills. But at the same time, technology leaders need to, at some point in their career, if they, have, if they are so interested, they need to start developing a separate set of skills which make them very effective at board level. So I think both of those are required. I mean, I think that's really interesting. It's, it, you, know, you don't want to hire the IT guy, put him on the board and say, right, we're covered now. You know, sort of thing. You, you, you know, it needs to be a bit more in, in investment and diligence. Yeah. Tucci, I mean, this this is probably something which which you've experienced, right? I mean, we we've got Robert Hook, one of our one of our um, 
uh, audience members saying he couldn't agree more, more, more with this. The digital services and medias are as deeply embedded in every part of life in 2020 as electricity, water and sewerage. Well, that's fine, but you're not running an electro electricity, water or sewerage business. You're running something that's a little bit hard to understand for the common person, right? So how important has it been for you, particularly with your fundraising, to, to make sure that the people that you're talking to at board level have good understanding of, of technology and where it's taking your business? Fantastic question, and I think it's part of our job actually to learn how to explain in a way that anyone can understand. And it's not just a challenge for fundraising, also to onboard customers. Uh, we work with world's largest consumer companies from Unilever, Pepsi, PNG to IKEA, and your counterparts who are buying this solution do not necessarily have PhDs in physics, and they shouldn't need to. We should be able to explain in a way that it's accessible to anyone. Um, but I remember the very first time when we raised our seed round, our seed investor had told me that, Tuja, your biggest challenge with this business is going to be just to explain how does it actually work while you are fundraising. Everything else is going to be a lot easier in terms of performance and you know, KPIs, etc. And I think everyone is coming up the curve that what we see when we started six years ago to explain what deep neural networks do why do we need them? Why does it take so much investment to build um, a knowledge graph? How is, how is a knowledge graph constructed? And there was a lot of, you know, people feeling, asking, for example, statistical questions, which are irrelevant because at the scale of data that we are dealing with, which are millions and millions, some statistical questions become irrelevant. But I can see the market is moving super fast. Now we go to customer meetings, they already know what hyperparameters are, for example, before we even start the you know, conversation about it. And I see the same thing at the board level as well, like the saviest investors are coming up to speed quite fast. Let's move on to our next question. Um, so this one's a, li a little bit of a, um, uh, a kind of inspiring type question. So which industry sectors or standalone organizations do you think are making the greatest advancements with technology and what are they doing that stands out? So I'm, go I'm going to come to you, Ben, right? So Oak, no uh, Oak North are, are doing some fabulous stuff themselves, right? And, and I think you, you might feature in other people's answer to that question. But it'd be really interesting to know who's inspiring you out there? Who's doing stuff that you're thinking, wow, that's interesting. That's, that's a great use of technology. It's innovative. Yeah, I mean, I think for, for me, the thing that always kind of excites me or impresses me is when I see someone taking a or just starting with the, the customer problem rather than starting with the technology. Um, yeah, we, I won't talk about Oak North, but I am kind of, I do spend 99.9% .9 of my time in fintech. So I'm a little bit blinkered to, to fintech, but um, the banks that we work with, they have a real desire to change both in terms of their operational processes, their decision-making on credits, just, you know, how they work with their customers. And so, we get a lot of kind of interaction with the banks, with our, our clients um, about the other types of projects that they're working on as well. So, you know, there's companies like Encino in the US who are basically taking their mission to basically enable all banks around the world to do digital transformations. So rather than banks having to figure this out by themselves, they've got a really trusted partner with a really great platform that we integrate with. And actually it just, you know, this guy kind of, um, it creates an ecosystem where it's going to enable innovation for the, you know, more, you know kind of other uh, companies trying to solve very specific problems, you know, kind of credit and payments and, and stuff. I think another company I personally really admire is Stripe, just because they're taking such massive um, kind of problems, you know, their, their mission statement of, uh, you know, grow the GDP of the internet is, is almost, you know, as, as more, you know, it's hard to kind of think about bigger things really. Um, but the way that they're just starting from first principles and using kind of, you know, it's not even about the complexity of the technology, just they are using technology to reinvent how businesses um, interact with financial services. So, yeah, I think, I think Stripe and Encino are two really great companies, um, but it's, it's not about the tech, it's about the problem that they're solving for their customers and how they're really kind of helping drive change in their industry from it. Yeah, I think that's great. And, and, and it's good to hear a technology leader saying it's not about the tech, right? Because we, we all know as leaders in technology, that's exactly what it's not about. 
tech is just an enabler for these things. But a good, a good couple of references there. Will, I'm going to come to you in a second because I know you, you'd like to talk about partners that you work with in this space who, who you would uh, admire. But but audience members, do do ping us. You know, if there's if there's companies that you think uh, you know really inspire you from a technology standpoint, ping ping us in the chat and um, and we'll we'll uh, we'll have a conversation about them. Will, what what about your partners? Uh, you, you, they inspire you a bit, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd echo uh, um, you know, ben, Ben's points around this in that uh, um, you know, maybe the technology pieces of it, are, although they're enabling the transformation, in a lot of ways, they're the least interesting part of it. It's what you, you're able to do for customers and what uh, uh, needs people have been able to identify and, 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 and pivot towards. Uh, you know, have been really proud as, as Libre to kind of be uh, more involved in the technology parts of certain businesses, so powering uh, the Nando's uh, um, delivery applications through like a white label system on, on, on their part. You know, this is this is something that we can now do to help them uh, move faster and move in a tech, more technologically uh, uh, you know, savvy kind of way. Uh, and actually, even once you go outside the partners, I, I think the the general resilience and and uh, entrepreneurship in, 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 in the food uh, uh, space overall has been really inspiring to see whether that be uh, people pivoting their own small businesses from restaurants to providing uh, takeout meals or grocery uh, uh, delivery businesses to uh, small businesses banding together to form services like uh, Dishbatch or, or Big Night, uh, which you know, even though I shouldn't, shouldn't say oh, I've used, I've used both of them, they've been, they've been fantastic fulfilling a need which I didn't even know that I had uh, for kind of restaurant branded home meal kits uh, to uh, uh, you know, the explosion of people doing uh, subscription boxes and, 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 and uh, um, you know, kits uh, uh, which of course are massive things prior to the pandemic, but just the scale that they've had to push for their operations uh, uh, to cope with the increase in demand and, 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 and the switch to a more technologically enabled uh, business model has, has been um, you know, really, uh, uh, really fantastic to see. So all over the food space has, has been kind of inspiring examples for us. That's excellent. Thank, thank you. Some, some good examples there again. Ed, what's, what's, what's the establishment's view on this? What, what, what's, going, what's going good and taking the attention of the government, do you think? In what sense, David? In, in, in the sense of uh, inspiring technology organisations, le people leading the way out there. What, 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 what are some that, that you, uh, you, you sort of think are uh, leading the way and showing, showing people how it's done with tech? Well, I think uh, one of the uh, things that I thought the government did very well under David Cameron, and I'm obviously party free, was actually its own government services. So uh, it made real progress in providing uh, digital services to citizens. And it change the whole concept of government. Um, the uh, stickers that everyone put on their laptop was, you know, what is the user need? And traditionally, I think government has got it wrong because it's always looked at what is the producer's need? How do we look after the workers, if I can put it that way? Nothing wrong with looking after the workers, but never actually thinking how people use services. And I always used to joke that apart from tax and passports, the most used services, the least used service on a government digital service was um, an application to be buried at sea, which you can actually do digitally now. But I think, uh, you know, apart from obviously Deliveroo and others, I mean, I think that uh, the, the, the trick for government, uh, and again, uh, I, I'm sorry to come across as somebody who's always looking backwards rather than forwards, but the trick for government is to embrace, I think, disruption. So when you see companies like Uber or Deliveroo uh, doing things differently. Uh, the trick is not to say, how do we stop this happening? Because we have to protect the incumbents. The trick is to say, what can we learn from these companies and how can we enable them? I think in terms of what government is seeing now, uh, I think fintech is obviously uh, a very important area where I think to the government's great credit, they continue to push forward. Uh, there's a fintech review going on under Ron Khalifa, for example, the founder of WorldPay. Uh, and I think again, the trick for government with tech is to recognize the existing strengths of your economy. We obviously have very strong uh, financial services sector in the UK. We have a strong cyber security sector in the UK because of uh, the GCHQ ecosystem. We have a strong artificial intelligence ecosystem because of deep mind. So the trick with government, I think, is to target those areas where the UK has perhaps an element of USP. 
Yeah, no, I think I think that's I think that's true. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with looking back. You know, it's a good way to to, to measure ourselves going forward, right? I think I, I think that's that's really good. And um, I like the idea of you know this question was about inspiration, and basically you all sort of came up with examples of of companies that we should look at and go to Ed's point. How do we do that? How do, how do, can we do the same thing? How can we how can we copy? There's there's nothing wrong with copying somebody else's innovation, right? Let's uh, let's move on. I'm going to stick with you, Ed, if that's okay for a minute. Um, companies are innovating rapidly. What will it take to exceed our customers' expectations in a digital world? So everybody's turning up. Everybody's absolutely kind of like wanting more, 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 and and the more innovative companies are delivering more, more, more. When, when are we going to run out? When are we going to not be able to, you know, meet the demands of, of the, the increasing demands of the of the British consumer? Well, I always uh, dine out on what I think is an apocryphal story, which is one of the reasons that the UK is uh, head of the game in tech to a certain extent is because EasyJet was the first company to offer people the opportunity to buy airline tickets online in the early 90s. And I do think... Um, it's, some, it's a point that's not made often enough, actually, that, you know, the British consumer's role in the tech revolution, which is I think the British consumer is much more inclined to try and use new technology than consumers in other parts of the world. And you take, you know, I referred to fintech in my earlier answer, you, you go to the US in terms of financial services, and the, it feels a bit like the Stone Age compared to the kind of apps and so on that British consumers are prepared to use. Uh, but I think... Um, you know, obviously, you've got a whole host of experts on this call who are actually running digital companies. But uh, to me, to a certain extent, the sky's the limit. I mean, I do, although in some ways it's regarded as a sort of big white whale, I do regard Amazon as one of those kind of big companies that does push uh, the envelope in the sense that, you know, Amazon Prime, when it was announced, when it, uh, it was two or three years ago, seemed completely kind of uh, absurd that you could order something that the, the consumer would want to order something and get it in two hours. Uh, but of course, the minute the service is provided, consumers uh, do do want it. So I think that, um, uh, and, and you know, when we talk about, you know, drone delivery, which again, in this it, here and now, you and I, where we kind of sitting in the pub would probably say drone delivery, it's insane. Uh, in three years time, it could be the norm that apparently there are architecture firms now designing residential homes with a mini drone landing pad for delivery. So I think uh, the ideas that we think are out there and slightly absurd today actually could be the norm in two, three years time. And I think, again, uh, kind of tying together my slight stream of consciousness that again is the trick for government which is to constantly you know i i always used to say uh with the tech sector the reason i loved it so much was because it was full of people saying this is how we do things today ordering a taxi how do we change what is actually a routine and quite dull thing to do using technology and you actually end up making it very exciting and very different and i think that is why tech is such an exciting sector yeah, I, 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 I tend to agree. I mean, Will, you know, I think to Ed's point about, you know, who knew that everybody would have an expectation of getting Amazon deliveries the next day, right? Your, your company's experienced this. You were doing some amazingly new things in delivery, and now everybody's taking it all for granted and wants more, more, more. How, how have you found that? Absolutely. I, but I, 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 I don't see there's a, a negative point at all. And exactly as, as, as Ed was saying, the sky's the limit with, with the potential for innovation here. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very interesting to kind of, think back and put yourself in the mindset of how things were at a given point in the past rather than focus at the now. Um, you know, if, if, if you think back to delivery founded in 2013, it was a, a novel and interesting idea that you could get any restaurant food delivered to you uh, uh, um, at home just with a press of a button. Um, that's now the baseline. Uh, uh, you can see, you know, now the expectation is, wait, if, if, I, if, I, if I don't have this food in 15 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever it is you, you say that I'm going to get it in, then that's now a, a, a massive negative. You can see the same things in, 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 in terms of, of kind of personalization, kind of user recognition on, on, on applications where, uh, you know, you might have been thrilled 10 years ago that an automated email actually knew your name. Uh, now, anytime like uh, uh, you call up a customer service department and they don't know your entire order history and your intention when you were purchasing different things, you think it's an outrage and, 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 and a disgrace. Um, 
And so, so the interesting question which comes next is, is which bets will be the ones which uh, uh, kind of cause us to have those aha moments in the, in, in the future and go, well, of course it's this way. Why wouldn't it be? It might be, uh, uh, you know, it might be drone delivery. It might be, uh, um, you know, it might be uh, 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 driverless cars. It might be, uh, uh, you know, city farms. We don't know which of these things is going to be the, the norm in the future, but it's really important that we continue to innovate and find the thing which becomes that new point of normalization. Uh, I'll just close on one last thing. I uh, hope everyone's seen a, um, a, uh, an online website called uh, Wait But Why. It's one of my strongest recommendations consistently. He talks a lot about uh, uh, the pace of innovation and how long it takes you to have like a mind blown moment. Uh, in the, if you grab someone from 1850 and you stuck them in 1860, uh, you probably wouldn't blow anyone's mind. Maybe there's some cool stuff which has happened with you know, latest innovations in steam uh, engines, but you take someone from uh, um, you know, 1960 and you stick them in today, and that is a officially mind blowing kind of uh, um, uh, uh, chain of te technological advance. And this time that you kind of have to transport yourself from what is a mind blowing length of time is getting successively shorter and shorter. Uh, and so I do hope that the sky's the limit and, 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 and we, keep on, we keep on bringing these frames closer and closer together. I Can I just butt in and say uh, on Will's point that I thought it was uh, it's a very telling point. It's a brilliant point, actually. I'm going to it's why, but wait, I have to go on. Wait, but why? Wait, but why? It does okay. highlight the sectors that aren't really being touched by tech. And I just wanted to quickly say things like education. Mm -hmm. Your friend from 1860 walking into a classroom today would think nothing's changed here. Yeah, no, that's really that's really important. And and to, to that point, we've got uh, one of our um, audiences said that, um, uh, you know, why don't we have an Apple, Amazon, Google or Tesla in the UK? And how can we change that? You know, maybe there are things in the education sector or other sectors where we could get these. I, I, I'm not keen on the whole unicorn thing, but where we could get these people applying massive, you know, investment in in, you know, those special areas, I guess. Tucci, that might be something you can pick up on. You know, somebody who's got investment, you're going into an innovative area or you've been in it for a while. But, you know, what, what, what do you think about this? You know, are, are, are you going to be able to exceed customers' expectations or at some point is it all just going to be a bit, all right, enough now, that's what it is and we're not doing anymore? I don't think any technology company can exist that way. And it's an interesting discussion that you have to convince the capital backing behind the business why you need to do that in a continuous basis. There are times I would get questions around you know, board meetings that you have the most cutting edge technology. Why are we still investing in 40 more machine learning engineers? Like, can't you just sell what you have, right? Which we can, and I can definitely achieve our targets for this year and next year if I did that. But if we want to stay ahead of the market in three years, we need to build that technology. We need to start building that technology today. Right. And it constantly comes from the client conversations, what they need, observing what they need and start responding towards that now. So I never met any technology leader where they would say that, well, we can pause now and now let's see what happens because you're going to fall behind incredibly fast. There's another interesting question on the Q&A side about like, why are we not seeing Amazons and the likes of it emerging, you know, out of UK? I mean, I think we have to, first of all, give a lot of credit to Deliveroo here, right? Our homegrown company um, with incredible scale. And I, I'm sure Deliveroo is not gonna be alone in that journey. One thing, you know, Ed joined, uh, touched earlier, in some countries, it's interesting, although Britain is ahead in technology adoption for sure, like compared to FinTech in the US, for example, some of the other countries are leapfrogging us. Actually, we make payments in 150 countries, micropayments, like a dollar, and our payment integrations in Africa are a lot more successful than some of the most developed countries because they all use wallets, digital wallets, and they completely leapfrogged banking, right? In like traditional sense. We see similar trends in China, like the technology adoption in China is significantly ahead of the UK. So we kind of need to be a little bit mindful of that. Um, while we are probably ahead of the game in the Western world, actually the non-Western world is getting ahead of us. I think that's true. And I, th I think, you know, just talking about, you know, getting ahead and, and, and making sure that you're using all of that, those modern approaches, modern technology, um, Nadia, one of our audience members, has said, how are regular companies expected to keep up, right? And I think, you know, we're, we're all here and we're talking about our companies and the great stuff they're doing. 
I guess partnering is probably a good way to, to keep up. If you're not an expert, you know, then, then going for a partner. Anna, what, what experiences might you have in, in, in that area in terms of making those strategic partnerships to get that technology advantage? Um, I think, uh, you know, sorry. Yeah. I, I think the, 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 uh, the point is actually, I was thinking about Deluru when, when you talked about partnerships, the fact that, you know, you're partnering with large supermarkets now to turn their supply chains on its head and get stuff to people in 15 to 20 minutes. That's a great example of partnerships. And I, I think that's something that you will continue seeing quite a bit in the, in the next uh, uh, few years. But that's not just in the, in the delivery food delivery sector. We will probably see a lot of this happening in healthcare. We're already seeing it. We know that COVID alone has basically made, you know, they used to say that nothing happens for decades, but then in one year, decades happened. That's how healthcare sector is actually thinking about digital transformation now, right? And a lot of that will have to be by necessity based on participation, sorry, partnership with uh, other people who are doing cool stuff. And but the, the, just uh, going back to the earlier point about why do we not see uh, the Googles and the Amazons out of, out of the UK, uh, part of it, I have a slightly contrarian point of view on that. I think we need to look to our strengths, actually, because what we forget is that there are some things that every, all, all of these companies come out of innovation clusters and decades worth of work and research and government grants and funding and you know all of the academic work behind that that's what culminates in all of these big companies and we do have in the uk some amazing sectors that are actually really ripe for that kind of explosive growth biotech is an example you know obviously i'm not in any way qualified to talk about biotech i don't work in biotech i'm not a scientist i don't know anything about it other than the fact that i'm a student of the industry and i look at it so what is really mind blowing in a, in a very it's not normally front of mind for people who work in other tech sectors but would you believe that according to the association of investment companies uh, biotech sector has had 491% return over the last 10% compared to the 198% average on every other sector, UK, right? There are at least two $1 billion uh, uh, valuation companies that have been spun out of com in universities like King's College to go off and do amazing things like, you know, Gamma Delta, a company that's working on, you know, cell therapy for cancer, as an example. And with COVID vaccine coming up, that's another shot in the arm. So maybe what we should be doing is not chase after trying to come up with the next Google necessarily. We look to our own strengths and we double down on, you know, how, how do we take advantage of the fact that 50% of the best life sciences universities are in Europe. And, you know, we have some of the, the, some of the top 10 in the UK. Maybe we should take advantage of that and, and build into it. I think that's a brilliant point. I think we don't, uh, the life sciences get no media coverage at all. And yet it's a huge UK strength. I mean, Absolutely. my answer to the Google Amazon question is always about money and finance. Uh, we have everything that Silicon Valley has. What we don't have is a wall of capital that will give someone, a two person company, a hundred million dollar check to expand. Nor do we have, but we are getting it founders who have $500 million in their back pocket, plus the experience of building a billion dollar company, who are gonna build the next one. Now, you know, you can, people can have their views on Mike Lynch, but the fact is, you know, he started Dark Trace based on having started autonomy, but the life science point is fantastic. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's good. And up in my part of the world in Norfolk, you know, we're, we're building something called the Tech Corridor between Cambridge and, and uh, Norwich. Um, because of the biotech and the agritech and the life sciences community that we've got up here. And there's massive investment going into that. So I don't know why it is, Ed, as you say, you know, it's not well talked about, but there is a lot of stuff going on, on in that world. I, I love the idea, Anna, of playing to our strengths. I think that's, I think that's really important. Um, so um, a, 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 few, uh, a few suggestions from some of our audience. So um, probably one to throw to you, Ben. So uh, Revolut, Monzo, Starling and TransferWise have made significant process in financial innovation. Ed touched on this. You know, we, we do seem to be at the forefront of fintechs. What, 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 why is that, do you think? Is that playing to our strengths? Uh, I, I mean, I think, and, and Oak North as well, right? I've got, had the privilege of working for, for two very successful uh, UK-based fintechs. So, um, I mean, I think it's part of playing to our strengths. There's, there's so many people who just have, you know, wealth of experience in, you know, in financial services in London. It's, it's kind of a foundational thing. Um, I think that it's, 
it's kind of, uh, there's maybe a couple of other things as well. I think one is just the real passion to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that, you know, obviously I know Anna Starling and Rishi Oak very well, and they, that it's the founder's story. You know, they've been heavily involved in financial services, completely different um, aspects of it, but they've come across problems that they've just, they've just thought to themselves, right, I've had enough, I've got to go solve this myself. So it's like the, you know the the ex, the experience and then the you know the not not just to kind of identify the problem but actually have the confidence to actually know that we can take this on and, and solve it um and just not really have a plan b you know it's but i think it's just that it's like the the experience and the desire and i think just because we've got critical mass of people in financial services you just kind of you're going to get one or two at least of those companies to break through and as soon as you've done that then you start to to see this whole ecosystem appear um you know i think the the thing for for me maybe slightly related to the previous question as well is just it's it's basically being and this is something that amazon's very good at is just being unafraid to take really 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 big bets you know it's not about just tweaking this and optimizing this by one percent it's like you know amazon go and create a movie studio which i was involved in in 20, 2014. All right it's like you know who'd have thought like 10 years before that people would be making these types of bets to go and drive their business so i think you know we've got folks in, in financial services willing to to make those big bets but it's kind of going from zero to one for like not having a company to having a company i think the the, the interesting thing for me is what comes next, where these companies go from just having one business and one product to start and having multiple businesses and multiple products. Um, you know, so I think it's only really the start of the financial services innovation in the UK, I think. Oh, well, that's great. And let, let's hope that we get that kind of, you know, uh, desire, effort and interest, as you're saying, in, in a few other sectors, because it, it seems to be the way that we get stuff done, right? So yeah. uh, I'm not yeah. sure we'll see the, the, the Starling or the Oak North or the Monzo movie studio, though. Well, maybe not. You never know. A little bit of diversification never hurt anybody, Ben, right? Somebody else has asked just around this, and we'll, we'll finish up on this question for, with this point, right? Does the panel think that the continued innovations you're discussing will be inhibited by an increased reluctance for individuals to share personal information under GDPR, which may impact data mining, etc.? A lot of innovation relies on developing personalized products that require that information. I think this is really true. This is an area that my business is getting into more and more heavily. Um, you know, I, I know from my own experience and my and my friends and family's experience, the whole kind of world where you just, you know, every we're all having these conversations at the minute about, I'm sure Facebook is listening to me. I'm sure I mentioned that I was interested in a lawnmower and five seconds later, Facebook is trying to sell me a lawnmower, right? And and I mean, we all know that's absolutely bloody true, right? So I think, but, but my question here is, is that do we think that this is all going to slow down? Do we think that GDPR legislation is going to slap us all down and we're all going to have to go back to a much more bland experience where, quite frankly, the consumer is going to have to work harder for what they want. Interesting. That, that one's open to anybody who dare have a go at it. David, can I jump in on something I feel very passionately about? Sure. Um, the impact of GDPR has happened and we all got prepared and we all got compliant and it lived through. I would say we are seeing exactly the opposite. People want to share more and they actually want to do that in a secure environment where they can trust their data with the companies who are actually taking all the necessary measures to be able to stick to the you know, authenticity under which conditions they are sharing that data. So I always remind people there are two really, really key points here. Being open with the user what the data is going to be used for. That was a big change with GDPR and every company got forced to do that. But the new generation companies are built that way from scratch anyway. So you are transparent about your usage of data. And secondly, you have to heavily invest in the security of that data. In our case, for example, the entire data set is pseudonymized. What that means is that although we know your phone number, your email address, your name and your address and everything, the actual data set is completely disconnected so that even if the system is hacked and the data is stolen, no one can connect the actual data set back to your, your, your user details, which is a simple system 
for security purposes. But it's really interesting to observe that in many markets, we operate in 150 markets, we are seeing that people are increasingly willing to share that data as they can trust the organizations about it. And, and I don't think it's just trusting the organization. That's a, that's a big thing. So we have to invest in that, in our brands and all of that kind of stuff. But I think also it's like I, having experienced bits of it, I think our consumers like they want more personalization, a bit more commit. So they don't see all the rubbish that they're not interested in, but they actually get a more focused thing. Ed, let's just, I, I've got to move on to the next question, but I'm, I've got a funny feeling you might have been the tech minister when GDPR was first mooted, right? So, so did, did it work out how you guys thought it was going to work out? Well, I was the tech minister when we brought in the e-privacy directive, which is why you get this annoying pop-up about cookies. Uh, so it's your fault, basically. On the website. Okay, great. And uh, look, I think this is a really important topic, and I think there are two aspects to it. I mean, clearly, uh, by the way, my son is playing Xbox downstairs, if you can hear some kind of crazy... If you think there's a massive party going on in my house, it's my son shouting at his mates on Xbox. Um, and the dog has opened the door, so that's why I can't shut the door. Um, no problem. So, uh, anyway, I digress. You know, heavy regulation is a bad thing, in my view. Uh, I'm not against regulation. I think it's important. And politicians often regulate in a vacuum. They don't actually talk to businesses about how day-to-day -day it happens. Having said that, the GDPR came in during the tech clash and the GDPR is now seen as a kind of gold standard consumer protection regulation to the extent that California has effectively adopted it and probably the US will eventually adopt it state by state, if not through at the federal level with a Democrat administration. And, you know, there has to be this dialogue between tech and, and government. And I think it's always right for politicians to say we represent the public square. So, for example, the online harms bill coming down the road about trying to regulate content online, I think it's perfectly legitimate. You know, if tech people just say, oh, you don't understand tech, totally the wrong response. It's perfectly legitimate to have that debate. The second thing I want to say, which is a point I picked up because I'm on this communications and uh, digital select committee on the House of Lords, and we've been taking evidence, is actually, I think this will spawn regulation. I think Tugay was kind of hinting at this, spawns other ecosystems. So. You could have, for example, moderation as a service platforms where companies are created, could be billion dollar companies that provide moderating services for platforms where people are, are at, you know, they could be moderating as we speak, the, the Zoom chat for our thing. You could have lo loaded up the moderating software. So I think that, um, and, and, and that, that could potentially be a public good, that, you know, uh, it, it could help businesses get online knowing that they have a moderating as a service software backing them up uh, to you know keep the crazies off if you like so i think that could also spawn a lot, a lot of interesting kind of tech support ecosystems just you know similar to the cloud you know the cloud was there to support the massive uh, growth in tech companies and i think there will be similar software service companies coming up to support tech regulation yeah, no, I think I think you're you're probably right there. You, your point about uh, California taking on uh, GDPR, I, I feel that pain on a daily basis. Our we're, our, our uh, uh, Naked Wines headquarters in the US is in is in California in the Napa Valley, obviously, and CCPA, the California Consumer Protection Act. Wow, that's a tough one to navigate. It's like they took GDPR and shot it in the arm, right? You know, sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that, Ed. Uh, anyway, uh, okay, so we're going to move on to. <laughs> We're going to move on to, to our, oh, sorry, Will, go on, go on, go on. Yeah, uh, sorry, I think, I think it's just an interesting, interesting point just to evolve on that a bit, because David, you touched on it before, uh, um, which is we're talking about regulation, but actually a lot of this is, is, is really sourced in the kind of consumer mindset, uh, where realistically consumers are happy to give, or in general, consumers are happy to give data where they are extracting value from it. You know, if I can get personalization as a result from this thing, fantastic I, I i i can see why and 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 kind of how that that data is used and this doesn't this you know initially puts a stronger uh, uh, uh focus on companies to protect and, and secure that data but ultimately actually it becomes part of the ecosystem to, to to show to customers that you can provide value for it especially when you think about the generational shift that you have between uh, uh you know people who are are you know maybe like yourself playing xbox right now ed and you know very very conscious of what data is uh, um, you know, 
has longevity and has a static property versus what is ephemeral like Snapchat and deliberately meant to be uh, 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 deleted and, 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 and disappearing. Yeah. Um, you know, having that, having that education around what data is you're generating, what you're giving it to, and then having the expectation of a company uh, uh, to do something valuable with it is, 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 is going to be so important in kind of driving that, uh, 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 that process of innovation actually forward rather than slowing it down. Yeah, and I think I think people are smart. I think you know the the the, the understanding of, of the benefits of giving your your personal information and stuff like that, and what you get out of it is increasing. We're we're highlighting that more. So yeah, I agree. Okay, this this next one's a little, little bit of a mouthful. I, I I don't like the question the way it's written. I've tried it about four times on myself. We're talking about digital transformation. Ah, oh, big buzzword. You thought you were going to get through a conference without talking about digital transformation, right? Um, we know that the, the, maybe some of the older organizations have, have culturally been a little bit like, oh, we don't want to change stuff, it's too big and hairy, it's work the way it is. So digital transformation, they often blame legacy technology challenges. It's too hard, it would cost too much money, or, or regulatory barriers or whatever. And, and there's a lot of like, you know, we can't do this, we can't do it, it's not right for us as a business. And then COVID hit, and it just went woof. And everybody suddenly just had to embrace technology in all sorts of ways a lot better. And in many ways, just like the working from home thing, we're not talking about that, but it disproved all those naysayers. It was like, yeah, no, you can. It doesn't matter what your business is. You, you can embrace this, right? And we've seen some great examples of that. I'm sure all of you guys have got some great examples. But, you know, do we feel that digital transformation is a given now for everybody or, or are we all like particularly with the vaccine around the corner is everybody going to go all right we could probably hold that off for a bit now we yeah we'll we'll just carry on for a bit now we don't we don't we'll get back to the old boring ways of doing stuff what what, what do people think about that um uh go on then ed well i think uh you know it is the kind of 64 million dollar question but it, it the the answer i think is is pretty straightforward which is you know it's quite clear that a crisis creates, uh, accelerates change. Uh, wars accelerate change. And in many senses, this was a war. Um, and it's quite clear to me, certainly in the white collar profession, uh, where people do have the luxury of, to a certain extent, choosing their work location, that hybrid working will become the norm and this kind of nine to five FaceTime will not be insisted upon. But having said that, all of us on this panel, and I'm sure everyone listening, we miss human contact. We know the difference between sitting around a table, kicking around ideas, and sitting on a Zoom, kicking around ideas. They are different experiences. But we also know that if you've got one meeting in the day, you're, you're not gonna schlep into town for it. You're gonna say, let's do this one on Zoom. So uh, it's gonna be hybrid. There will have been a lot of acceleration, uh, you know, in terms of entertainment and things like that and streaming. There'll be lots of change which will kind of uh, settle down. And I think in many respects, going back to the answer to my first question, as it were, it will be that more and more companies do realize that it's not physical and digital. It's one thing. Yeah. OK, I understand that. Ben, I know you had some experience when you were at Starling of this kind of doing that transformation, digital change. Tell us about that. I'm not sure uh, anyone at Starling would say they did digital transformation. I think it was just that from from day one. Uh, to be honest, I, I think the the main point, the main experience for me actually is with the banks that we work with, with at Oak North. Like, I think the the thing that's most important, I think, is people being able to take calculated risks. Like, I think that the, the danger is change equals risk, and risk means you can't do anything, right? You get people stuck in that kind of you know, in the status quo. So, so I think that the important thing is, is having the right team of people who are willing to challenge the status quo. And they are going to come across people who tell them they can't do that, or that's not possible, or we tried that before, and it doesn't work. And you've got to just almost unashamedly, just kind of do it anyway. Right. And it's, it doesn't mean you're reckless. It just means you have to be very thoughtful, very detail orientated, you know, have the right kind of first principle thinkers in the team who are just trying to innovate on behalf of the customer. So I think that getting that kind of team process mentality in places is important. And I think the thing with, you know, 
I hate to use the term with digital quote unquote companies. It's just, that's the mentality the founding team have, you know, and, you know, so you don't have to go through a digital transformation. And I think that it's one of the reasons why non-native digital companies are going to find it hard because it's really hard to shift the mentality of a whole company. You know, if you're shifting the mentality of 10 people, obviously that's a lot easier than like 25,000 people at a big high street bank. So, you know, I think it's why kind of just, you know, a lot of, you know, founding tech teams, just the reason why they think they can change an industry and compete with the, with the big established players is because they, it's going to take them so long to change the mentality. All right. So Anna, Ben's telling us just to break the rules and beg forgiveness later on and get on with it because it's the right thing to do. That, that was my summarization of what you said, Ben. Sorry to misquote you. Um, Anna, what about the cultural impact of that? And, and to Ben's point, you know, it's easy to change the hearts and minds of 10 people in a company who are trying to achieve something new and innovative. What about a company of a thousand people? You know, how, how, how do you go about and, and how do you get that innate cultural change spread throughout the whole organization? Because that's what we're hearing is needed for success, right? That's, a, that's an interesting question. And this is something that's probably you know, being debated by lots of people in lots of different ways across uh, different industries. I think the, the organization design has a, a big role to play in uh, the way companies are formed and they, they end up having their own culture and the way they work. And a lot of the, the big organizations that want to do digital transformation and sort of uh, become as good as digital native companies to use Ben's uh, term, um, they try to to do this at a, sort of like a at skin level you know let's just try and do some cosmetic changes and this will work no it doesn't work you have to start with org design so culture is a direct result of how you set people up uh, and you know if you have departments and the departments work in silos and they don't necessarily have common objectives you are going to find it so much more difficult to collaborate and get things that with projects that require multiple points of view off the ground. So the the it doesn't matter whether you have a, a ten million dollar ten million pound budget that year for digital transformation. If you could spend a tenth of that in actually actively breaking down the you know org design or changing org design and breaking down silos and getting people to work together on mundane things that they work day to day that will probably set up the the atmosphere the the kind of willingness to start working on riskier projects that require jumping off into the unknown a lot more in the organization so part of the time and this is where i'm probably very critical of uh, the top brass so to speak the, the, the leaders of any business if the organizational design is wrong if the context and the purpose and the way people are aligned is wrong it starts with the with the with the management team with the executive team board whatever you call it right so it's not something that you can't you can't have so there is this there's this corporate innovation theory of you know pirates in the navy and you, all you need is two or three good people and they will make all the changes yes they will try very hard then they will give up they'll go out and start a, a, a found a startup and probably will do what they were trying to do and change the industry outside the, the company. So there has to be a much more material change. And that's where the culture will start changing. And I think that's really, that's really true because a lot of these companies who, who don't have that appetite for change and aren't maybe taking it from, from seriously from the top, you know, they are going to be threatened by those people who, who just, you know, went right, well, we're going to leave and we're going to embrace it and, and we're going to do it ourselves. And I think that's something that those companies really need to listen to from the technology industry is that, you know, you might not be here. Look, just look at the last five years. Look at some of the businesses who have not survived because new entrants in the market have come along. And uh, yeah, Ben, I, I, I guess that the big banks are going to be around for a while, I guess. Right. They've got deep pockets. They're going to be there. But you are, you know, you're biting at their heels. Right. So the thing and, and, and you know, a lot of them have started either buying some of the smaller fintechs or partnering with them a little bit better. Surely that's because they're scared because of their culture and their approach to, to digital adoption. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, I can't see like the big banks disappearing anytime quickly. I mean, I think one of the, the things, you know, uh, I'm sure everyone in particularly the banking part of fintech knows or you know, will learn shortly is banking is actually mostly about lending. 
you know, and so I don't think that, you know, other than Open North Bank, actually, like, I don't think the fintechs have really cracked lending. Um, you know, I think there's been some opportunities with, with COVID that, you know, particularly Starlings made like massive, um, a massive opportunity of and done a really good job of. Um, but, you know, I think that the bank, the big banks are going to be scared when the, when, you know, when they, the, the fintechs crack lending. Um, but I think that, you know, there's two kind of things come to mind. One is, you know, it just goes back to the point before about making big bets. You know, when was the last time a, a high street bank made a big bet? in a new thing that I think they're like a bit, a bit on their heels. Um, and the fintechs are actually willing to take, take bets and be wrong and, and things. So, you know, I think the the thing I would be scared of is the ability and the willingness to take big bets, which, you know, Bonzo start, I mean, Revolut actually took a big bet on, you know, competing with Stripe, you know, with, with all of the services they announced the other day. So, you know, I think that's an example of a big bet that I just, I just can't really see the, the high street banks kind of doing, um, you know, and some of the, you know, the, I mean, obviously like the, the Netflix blockbuster example is kind of a, um, good one of the, on the innovation, the dile innovators dilemma type examples, but, you know, blockbuster tried an online streaming service and their exec team killed it. Right. Because they didn't get the right returns because actually to Anna's point, their organizational structure meant everybody just pointed and laughed at this business that made, you know, a fraction of a percent of the revenue of the, of the main business and so they got scared the team got disheartened and they just it just kind of shriveled away so i just see that's kind of the problem with the big companies and so you know unless it they they get their orgs right unless they get their culture right then you know they're not going to compete well, i think that's i think that's a good point and i'm just thinking about you know i'm looking at, at two chain well and i'm thinking ah they're working in innovative companies who embrace digital stuff so you know no point in asking them this question but i'm wondering in your past parts of your careers, you know, did you leave a company because you just didn't think they were going to embrace technology enough? And to Anna's point that it was ingrained from the top. Any, any of you ever sort of gone, right, I can't do this. I've got to go somewhere better. Yeah, so that actually describes pretty accurately uh, um, the reason why I kind of left and, and, and joined Delivery. Um, I was initially part of uh, the first job I had out of Actually, the very first job I had at university was 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 making chocolate, which was great. Uh, the first job which paid me money rather than like just about broke even uh, was with uh, Streetcar, a UK startup doing uh, car sharing, which was acquired by uh, by Zipcar, uh, an American company with a, with a similar sort of model. And very much the idea around it was the disruption of the transport uh, uh, you know system in in, in, in urban centres. Uh, you know, we had a vision to kind of transform the way that people moved in in in, in cities. Uh, and, and, you know, after uh, IPOing, we were actually acquired by Avis Budget Group, the, uh, the car rental people who, you know, had a, a vested interest initially, at least in kind of seeing this as a, a kind of innovative second business line. Uh, but uh, over time, thought a lot about kind of the, the success of their, their core business as they, as they would, because it was the thing that was generating profit and, and increasingly considered, well, how do we use these innovative tech tools in order to tweak and maybe make the rental car business like a little bit better, a little bit more effective, a little bit more uh, uh, like slightly hybridized. And, you know, whilst there was a, a short, for sure, a fantastic profit opportunity in that and some great synergies for the company, it was by no means a sort of uh, a technology first kind of approach to something. It was by no means a, uh, 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 the kind of revolutionary change, which you can see if you're, if you're in a, a you know, community of like-minded individuals kind of driving towards the change at pace. Uh, and so, yeah, that was, that was the reason why I quit and joined Deliveroo. <laughs> cool. Excellent. Thanks, Will. I think it's good to hear people's history and the, the personal choices they make based around, you know, the culture of a company and the direction that it's setting from the top. Tuche, what about you? Um, it's interesting, I think, um, that that's pretty much why I started Street Peace, um, because I was getting quite scant tired of working with research companies who just not going to use any technology to get us the results that we needed. So I was a strategy consultant in, in a previous life before Street Peace, and I started our technology practice within the consultancy. And I remember that we were doing actually some due diligence on Just It at the time, uh, pre-IPO. And it was super interesting because we needed data about takeaway behavior from Brazil, Russia, and we just needed that like yesterday, you know, we don't have two months to wait to gather the data. And I went to the, you know, traditional companies like Ipsos and Kantar, et cetera. And we, we basically told them, we even told them how they can do it with the technology we were recommending. We just needed the data. 
And basically, it was cannibalizing their consulting revenues and people-based revenues. And they were just incredibly resistant to it, to the extent that I felt, I'm just going to have to leave and start a data exchange platform, which does that, because none of the traditional 6 billion, 7 billion businesses are willing to do it. It's quite interesting. I, I think it comes back to, David, what you were saying about culture. Yeah, and I, and I think it's not, it's not um, you can do it within a big company. I remember when I was at Sky, um, you know, we came up with the concept of Now TV, which, of course, everybody n knows and loves now. But, um, you know, I, I think I was employee number one for Now TV and, and we got there and basically um, the board of Sky was sort of interested in it, but were worried that it was going to erode their core business in satellite television, right? Wow. And and now 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 TV is the golden child of, of Sky, right? And it complete and it took real boldness from the board. A lot of work, I have to say, to your point, Anna, of going in and convincing people and stuff like that. But it took boldness, which is guess I guess what you're saying, Ben, make those big bets, you know, and, and chase them through. So you can change that culture even within a large company if you've got the right kind of attitudes uh, going. Now, you know, it's coming up to Christmas, a little bit of a feel good question, this one. Um so, you know, we're going to enter into 2021 soon and uh, we've got we've got uh, the vaccine coming through strong. Um, so some some uh, light at the end of the tunnel there. I, I, I'll refer to Vita's question about Brexit and what's the opportunity there and how can we embrace that opportunity? So we, you know, hopefully we've got deal or no deal, but we've got Brexit giving opportunity, shall we say. Um, but what should businesses be most cautious of? from both a technology and market perspective, right? So I'm gonna ask all of you for this question just to, just to round up. Tute, we're, we're with you. Why don't we stick, stick with you on that? What are, what are the things that, you know, it's all looking good, but what caution should we step with? Um, you're asking the wrong person. I'm the optimist here. You know, we always look at the upside and what can go well and try not to worry too much about what might go wrong, but it, it, it's a good question. Um, I think the main thing that we are still seeing is um, with, with the whole, you know, vaccination, actually taking a step back, you know, the um, UK or about French Revolution. French Revolution didn't happen when the conditions are, were the worst. It actually happened when the wealth started increasing, but the people's hopes were increasing and raising faster. And there was a gap between the expectations, what people can actually get versus what they actually got, right? And I'm seeing a very similar situation right now with COVID. People are bored and sick of it. Vaccination is not catching up fast enough, but people feel like, okay, we are done with it, right? And as a result, we are gonna have a very difficult quarter one where people are just not willing to sit at home anymore and wait and, you know, the vaccination is not gonna show impact fast enough. And a lot of our customers are the world's largest consumer companies. Our conversations indicate that they are all bracing for a very difficult Q1 that can start actually putting some recessionary pressures. Um, so we are all basically bracing ourselves for that. Hopefully come June, July, when things are going to catch up and we actually will be able to resume our lives, things are going to get better. Okay, so a, a little bit of hope in there, but, but expect a bumpy ride first. <laughs> will, what about you? Cool. I'm a natural pessimist, so yeah, good, good, good counterbalance. Uh, but yeah, I think the the interesting thing is 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 maybe similar to the to the, the point of the French Revolution is 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 you know things that necessarily happen at precisely the point, uh, um, you know, where the exact change occurs. It only happens when when everything is filtered through and 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 and, and really you know come to fruition. Uh, you know, we know that we're going to have a, a kind of vaccination program which rolls out at some point. We know that we're going to start to see returns to normality at some point uh, in the next year. But actually, how many businesses will there be where even um, an 80% return to high street traffic or an 80% capacity in your restaurant actually puts you on the wrong side of your thin profit margins? Uh, so, you know, even though we've had a bumpy ride this year, from a commercial point of view, I think there are going to be a lot of businesses facing very, very strong challenges next year, uh, and are going to need to, you know, keep on fulfilling this, uh, you know, keep on feeling the same sort of pressure to innovate and 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 uh, pressure to change that we've seen uh, this year. Even though it may not seem as much of a public health crisis, it will absolutely, uh, 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 you know, still maintain that strong pressure to uh, to innovate and, and and grow out of it. Yeah, and I, I think I think you know some of those things are um, uh, are, are interesting, but but I, I don't know. I mean, you're a natural pessimist, you say, but 
I had a bit of hope in there, Will. I think, you know, I, I think things could things could get better, couldn't they? It's not all doom and gloom for those businesses. Maybe oh, what yeah. they need to do is just keep doing some of the innovative things they've been doing during the more lockdown periods. Absolutely. I mean, you know, from an op, you know, as, 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 as you said before, you, know, you can phrase things in, in two ways. It's it's a challenge, but it's also, of course, a massive opportunity uh, from you know, standing from the viewpoint of a company which is involved heavily in that disruption, in that innovation. I feel incredibly positive about us. I feel incredibly positive about uh, uh, you know industries being able to adapt and 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 kind of find opportunity in this, uh, but um, it, it's certainly not going to be a universal message of of, of good news. Ben, what, what's your thoughts on this one? All doom and gloom, or all looking bright and breezy? Um, no, I, I'm a natural pessimist as well. I'm sorry. Um, I think Anna and Ed, I'm coming to you in a minute. I hope you're optimist. We need a bit of brightness here, right? <laughs> I mean, just as the nature of kind of why I spend a lot of my time worrying about, I think just to the point points we were talking about before around GDPR and information security, I think it's it just continues to be, you know, a you know, if you if you get it wrong, a you know, the reputational damage that can can't be undone. I think that. You know, just as as the innovation is going, we've got to be really cautious about doing doing it very responsibly. Um, you know, there's a lot of people around. You know, fraudsters trying to, you know, look at everything that people are trying and trying to find any ways to exploit them. And so, I think that you know the the risk side, risk management side of things. You know, while these you know great innovations are happening, is equally important. I think that's true. I think also as as things return to normal, people will start to relax a little bit more, you know, companies and, and people and how they approach things. And so I think, you know, that's the time when we've got to be extra vig vigilant. And also, I think everybody got a bit of a buy during the major part of COVID. It's like, oh, we're in the middle of a pandemic, cut them some slack, right? I, I don't, you know, as we start to come out of it, we can't hide behind that anymore. We've got to be on our game, right? Anna, what do you feel about that? I, th I think the, the the one thing if the businesses need to be cautious about is resisting the temptation to go back to what they perceive as the comfortable old normal. I do believe that, uh, particularly for the younger uh, generations, this is a life-changing event for a lot of people. People's ideas about where they should stay, where they should work, how they should get entertained, where they should eat out, where they should eat in, everything has taken a, 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 a shaking this year, right? A big bit of a shake-up. People, our, our pre-COVID uh, e-commerce revenues were 20% of the retail sector. It's now went up, shot up above 30% and it's sort of stabilized at, at 30%. That's in one year, you know, more than 10 percentage points growth. I don't think people are going to go back to the old world. And any business that approaches 2021 as, okay, vaccines here, everything's back back to normal and buy, even if I, I can if I can somehow hold on to, a, a, you know, the commercial risks for six to eight months and things are going to back to normal and then I'd be fine. I think that's going to be a really bad uh, position to take. So that's the caution. It's funny, in, in, I'm actually very optimistic. I'm optimistic that there are very positive changes that will come out of this. And the only thing that businesses need to worry about is, forgetting that and trying to crawl back to the comfort blanket of a, a, a known normal, which is my point. Um, I, I've just been notified by BBC News app that uh, Boris Johnson has arrived safely in Brussels. So on that particular note, does that mean that 2021 is rescued? Is that is all good now, Ed? Is that is that are we done there or? Well, I mean, they'll try and put something together, you know, but it's all sort of irrelevant. You know, they've built the lorry parks and uh, everything that's going over to Calais is going to be paying, is going to be, they're going to be filling out forms and, and what should have been a roll on, roll off thing is now a 10 hour journey. So it's a uh, suboptimal. I mean, I am a pessimist as well in the sense that uh, I feel to a certain extent the economy is like, uh, you know, one of those cartoon characters that's run off the cliff and is still... Uh, you know, the legs are still kicking. I think there's a lot of uh, hidden unemployment and, uh, you know, quantitative easing and and so on has, has kept us going through the pandemic. But, you know, Rishi Sunak is fighting this constant struggle, you know, with the sort of devil and angel on his shoulder, desperately trying to kind of produce a budget that will start to get the economy back to balance and constantly being 
buffeted by people saying, no, you cannot stop furlough now and so on and so forth. At some point, it seems to me, there has to be a reckoning. So I think that's the first point. The second point uh, is trade wars. So I think we should not underestimate the fact that uh, what Trump started with China isn't going to stop with the end of Trump. It'll continue in some shape or form with Biden. And I think we will see a much more fragmented, you know, kind of new Cold War between China and the countries who are under China's influence and the West. Uh, and that will, and that is centered on technology. That is a digital war with a splintered internet, which I think is going to have serious repercussions for trade going forward. Okay. Well, there we go. 2021, hopefully shaping up to have a little bit of uh, happiness for us all. But um, but our, our panel of experts all giving us a little few words of caution. Um, been a really interesting session. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks for engaging. Uh, and audience also, thanks for some of the questions and, and points that you've submitted. I know we didn't get to them all, uh, but really, really nice to know that we're not just talking to ourselves here, although it was quite a pleasant conversation amongst ourselves. Uh, I'm going to hand back to Chris now, if that's okay, but thank you very much, panel. Cheers, David. Um, yeah, look, thanks everyone again from the, the speakers. Really engaging conversation. Um, thanks everyone who tuned in this evening. Appreciate it's December. We've got Christmas parties um, and things to do this evening. So. This is going to be distributed across all our platforms thereafter. So we'll send out a notification when this is live um, for you to kind of watch back if you want to. Yeah, have a great Christmas. Happy New Year. And see you in 2021.